Hello everyone, this is Tim, and after making the last video, it occurred to me that there is another subject that needs to be talked about as a follow-up to the message before going into the storm, as mentioned uh, in the last video. And what needs to be talked about here has to do with the state of society at this time and the characteristics of it. Um, so there are three passages in the Bible that describe what this time would be like. And I'm going to take the time to read these three passages and not just paraphrase them and just talk about them. But the first one is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. This is basically the last letter that Paul wrote before he died. It says here that this know also, that in the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, you may be thinking, wow, that's a perfect description of the world today. I mean, how could anybody could have called it that well 2,000 years ago? But what's really interesting is I'm not finished here. <laughs> He's not describing the world. He's actually describing the state of the church in the last generation. Because he goes on to say, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's that last statement that I want to speak on later. For now, I want to move directly into the next uh, passage that describes this time. And this is from the book of Revelation, chapter 3. In chapters 2 of, and 3 of Revelation, John is instructed to write letters to seven different churches on the Asian continent at that time. The last one is to the church of Laodicea. So even though this letter was originally written to a specific church in John's day, all seven of these letters paint a prophetic picture of different phases that the Christian church will go through throughout the course of history. Laodicea is the last one. And it says here, And unto the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This whole status of being lukewarm is something that is going to be uh, talked about also. But again, uh, first I want to get through these passages. The third one is from Jesus himself uh, describing the last generation. And in this case, this is specifically referring to the church because he says here, this is Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Um, it says here, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So, uh, these <laughs> fairly accurate uh, passages tell us where we are right now. And um, one thing I want to start with is regarding um, this parable of Jesus. You know, it says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Notice it doesn't say because the bridegroom tarried. Because if it did, that would indicate that it's Jesus's fault that things are the way they are right now, particularly with the church. And that is not the cause. Jesus is not the cause. There's actually two other causes that I want to bring out in this video. And this is the reason for making this video is to address these two causes because um, if they're not addressed, then people will um, be more likely to not regard the message that was shared in the earlier videos. One of these causes is, of course, this lukewarm message that is, by and large, proclaimed by just about every Christian body today. And, you know, it says because you're lukewarm, you're not hot or you're cold. Well, lukewarm is a mixture of the two, hot and cold. So this introduces the question, well, what does it mean to be hot and what does it mean to be cold? Well, in the 24th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus is talking about the state of things at the end, he says, and this is documented in verse 12, that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So coldness is associated with abounding iniquity and iniquity is simply a disregard for God's law and God's word. And love being cold, obviously the absence of love. So what you have with the Laodicean church is you have people 
claiming to represent God who uh, have unresolved guilt in their life. And as a result, they don't have love that they're coming from. Hot would be the opposite of that. People who have experienced the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the love of God that they present to people. So, you know, the Laodicean church, you know, they have all the right ideas of what righteousness looks like and how it should operate, but it isn't the truth of who they are because they're cold, no love. So um, that leads the question to, as to what would the Laodicean church's message actually sound like in real life. And I'm going to get into that, but not right now, because that's, uh, I need to get into the second cause because that's really the heart of what I'm presenting here. Everything else is built on top of that. So the second cause as to why the church is essentially asleep and in the Bible being asleep is associated with being in a state of security, um, not being concerned, um, not taking life seriously, things of that nature. But the second reason, the second cause for this state is something that I touched on in the first follow-up video, and that is this second chance narrative that as far as I can tell, almost all Christians believe in one way or another. Um, like, for example, well, as stated in the first follow-up video, if you believe that people have a second chance, unbelievers have a second chance to become believers, then there's no reason to repent of anything. You know, I read in the letter to the Laodicean church that Jesus instructs them to repent. But if people have a second chance, there's really no need to repent. They can wait. They can just, you know, live their selfish and indulgent life to their heart's content. And then once the second chance takes effect, then they can suddenly get serious and repent and all that. The second chance narrative is a lie. And as mentioned in the first follow-up video, the evangelical Christians believe in the rapture, which is basically a second chance for unbelievers to believe during the seven-year tribulation period. But the Catholics have a second chance narrative also that they may not be aware of. And that's this belief in purgatory because, um, with purgatory, it's a second chance. You can basically live as corrupt of a life as you want now. And then after you die, you go to purgatory and you have the hell burned out of you until you're fit to live in the realm of holy beings for the rest of eternity. Again, that's a lie. It's a lie in a couple ways, as talked about in the document. Humans are not naturally immortal, so there is no such thing as purgatory. And there's no such thing as a second chance. <laughs> this is your chance now, today. But one of the reasons for making this follow-up video that, you know, besides what is mentioned so far, is the fact that many Seventh-day Adventists have a second chance narrative also. And it wasn't until I was shown that I actually believed in this at one time um, not because I was looking for a second chance, but because I just thought, well, what is written here is just how it is. But um, <laughs> we're going to see that what is written is not saying what people are extrapolating. But this second chance narrative that so many Seventh-day Adventists believe, fortunately, is not embedded in the church's fundamental beliefs. And it's not based on the fact that Ellen White advocates this narrative either. It's based on certain individuals' interpretation of something Ellen White said. 
I'm going to share that with you right here. And that is a, uh, it's a couple of sentences from her book called Early Writings. This is on page 33. And she says here, I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth and they came out and endured the persecution with us. So, how Seventh-day Adventists have created a second chance narrative is based on our understanding of what is about to unfold. And I've talked about that in the document, and that's the reunification of church and state to come against those of us who are uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, as she says here. And part of this union of church and state is going to result in legislation and enforcement against God's people. And that is mostly seen in the, the uh, legislation of a Sunday law, because Adventism is about observing the Sabbath. It's part of the three angels' messages. It's part of um, God's revealed conditions for people to be accepted of God in his generation is to properly regard his law, which particularly involves the Sabbath, because the Catholic Church has assumed the authority to uh, place the solemnity of the Sabbath on another day. And um, so the Sunday law is something that's rather central to the Seventh-day Adventist approach towards the end. And um, how some Adventists interpret this uh, testimony from Mrs. White is when she says here that at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, the time of trouble, which is mentioned in the book of Daniel, is the close of probation. In other words, Christ has already decided who receives what reward when he comes, because it says in Revelation, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. When probation closes, Jesus has already made up his mind who gets what reward. And that is the beginning of what we call the great time of trouble. But what Mrs. White clarifies here later on in this manuscript is when she talks about the commencement of the time of trouble, she's talking about a little time of trouble that happens before the close of probation. And it's the fact that God has people who are filled with the Holy Spirit begins this little time of trouble and results, you know, it builds until the close of probation and the great time of trouble. But here's the clincher. Certain Adventists read this and they conclude that the cause for the commencement of this little time of trouble is a national Sunday law that is passed in the United States. And then that creates worldwide agitation that results in an international Sunday law that marks the close of probation. So basically, you have two chances. You have these two Sunday laws. The first, When the first one's passed, everybody who rejected the Sabbath truth can be like, oh, God's serious. It's time to, it's time to believe now. And then, you know, Adventists could say, ha ha, we're right and you should have listened to us. One of the reasons for making this video is um, a few months ago, I was reading a book of statements from Ellen White called Last Day Events. And one of the chapters in that book is called The Sunday Law. 
And it occurred to me every single time that she makes reference to the Sunday law, she's only referring to one. I didn't see anywhere in that book where she makes a distinction between one Sunday law at the beginning of the little time of trouble and then a second one at the beginning of the great time of trouble. No, there was only one. And when that law is passed, whatever that actually looks like, you know, in real life, things have changed since the 19th century. But whenever that legislation is passed against God's people, that's basically this world's way of telling Jesus, we all know where we stand. You can finish your work in the heavenly sanctuary and, you know, leave and stop interceding for us because we all know where we stand. So, um, out of these three second chance narratives, it's the Adventist one that is the most dangerous because according to that narrative, there can't be a revival of primitive godliness, which Ellen White talked about would come, which I mentioned in my document, in the minds of some Adventists, that can't happen until there's this Sunday law. It's like God's not allowed to have a revival until the Sunday law comes because they're right. And um, so anybody who has a message, you know, in regard to that is likely to be ghosted. So that's part of the reason for making this video because what really creates this time of trouble is the fact that God has a people whom he can fill with the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. And when that happens, there's going to be a very real and recognizable power shift. And we have an example of that from history. It was on the day of Pentecost. When the disciples of Jesus received the Holy Spirit, that was the end for Israel. And people who were aware, it, it was painfully obvious that um, Israel was no longer God's method of revealing who he is to the world. It was the apostles of Jesus that were God's instrument of revelation of who he is. And, um, you know, Israel's end came uh, a couple of years later when Rome went into D Jerusalem and destroyed the city and practically killed everybody or sold them off into slavery. And then, then Rome had to deal with the church. And then I, I talked about that in the history of Christianity in the document. But the point is, um, you know, when God's people are filled with his spirit, uh, it's not something that can be ignored. And the people who uh, are adhering to Laodicea's message and not repenting are going to be the first to recognize they missed out. And it's not going to be a pretty sight. But uh, getting back to this parable of the ten virgins, you know, it says at midnight, the uh, cry was made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. And um, midnight in prophecy, in, in biblical imagery, is a representation of the darkest time in this world's history. Uh, it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 2, um, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. You know, this midnight of earth's history is characterized by the greatest misapprehension of God's character by unbelievers and the greatest misrepresentation 
of God's character by those who are professed believers. And, um, you know, commenting on this parable of the ten virgins, Mrs. White says that at this time of midnight, God sends a message that is to lighten the world. And that's, you know, the Revelation 18 message, the latter rain and the loud cry. And, you know, this is all before the announcement is made to uh, wake up because the bridegroom comes. That's God's way of waking people up. Um, he'd prefer that they believe the message so that they can be prepared for the bridegroom's appearing. But those who don't prepare, <laughs> when God wakes them up, it's too late. It's like you either have, you're either prepared to meet the Lord or you're not. It's, it's not time for a revival at that point. It's time for God's wrath to be poured out. And um, it's interesting. Who is God's wrath poured out on anyway? You know, people think, well, God's going to let all the bad people have it. Well, it's interesting. After I finished writing this document, um, like a couple days later, I went to Las Vegas to visit my brother who flew in to that area to participate in a pool tournament. So I went up there to, visit, to see him. And when I was uh, in my hotel room, I had just like fallen asleep, but I could still hear. And I tend to listen to audio uh, on my phone when I go to bed, it helps me fall asleep. And I was listening to a recording of one of Ellen White's books. And um, something was said that literally made me jump up like wide awake and turn the light on and like look that up, which I never do because once I fall asleep, I don't like to get up. <laughs> but this was an exception. But anyway... There was a statement that uh, was made that I have here about the wrath of the Lamb, because that's what she was talking about. This is from a letter that she wrote on October 4th, 1900, from St. Helena, California, to a man named Arthur Daniels, who uh, would eventually go on to be the church's general conference president in the 1920s. But... She says here, one who ever showed himself full of infinite tenderness, patience, and long suffering, who having given himself up as the sacrificial victim, was led as a lamb to the slaughter to save sinners from the doom now falling upon them because they would not allow him to take away their guilt. It's very interesting. God's wrath is poured out on those who would not allow God to take away their guilt because Christ died for the guilty, which is everybody. And so they no longer have to be guilty. But as mentioned in the document, some people don't mind being guilty because it gives them a power trip and they feel proud that's why they don't repent. Even if they believe in God, they believe God's going to give them a second chance. Um, so uh, to me, this was like God putting his, it's like God notarizing the document that was put upon me to publish. It's like, this is his notary. This is stamp it, sign it, authenticated. But this gets into the message of the Laodicean church. This hot and cold. And um, I'm going to tie that in with what Mrs. White has to say about the parable of the ten virgins and it being midnight and the message that goes out 
during this time of darkness before the cry to awake occurs. She says here, those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold, your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The problem with the Laodicean church is that the grace of God really has done nothing for them because what they tell people is that it's impossible to manifest his glory because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And, um, you know, <laughs> I remember back in the late 1990s, uh, there was a man who got into a little bit of trouble with uh, a woman because he just happened to be the president of the United States. And he was drawn up to be impeached for his behavior, not only his behavior, but the fact that he lied on a court deposition in relationship to it. And um, just as it was time for Congress to... Uh, execute these articles of impeachment that were drawn up, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia went on national television and said, yes, the president is guilty of uh, perjury and obstruction of justice, uh, but we're not going to go forward with the impeachment uh, because the American people don't want us to. And uh, that didn't surprise me. What did surprise me is that, you know, the president being a good old Baptist boy, uh, his pastor went on to uh, not reprimand the president for his behavior, not make him subject to any form of church discipline or disfellowshipping, but he actually defended him from this same perspective. Well, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's not the truth. Um, that's a perversion of a Bible verse. The actual Bible verse says, for all hath sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The difference is past tense versus present tense. If you read the Bible, if you read the New Testament, you read the writings of Paul, when he talks about sin, he's talking about past tense. He's not talking about it in present tense. What he's talking about in present tense is the gospel. And he says to the church in Thessalon Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, that the whole purpose of the gospel is for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Laodicean church um, misrepresents the gospel because the pastors are abounding with iniquity. They have unresolved guilt in their life, and they're trying to do God a favor by becoming pastors. But really, all they're saying is, hey, everybody, I'm damned, and you are too. Isn't that wonderful? Who wouldn't want to go to a church like that? <laughs> but the real message, you know, the real gospel, you know, is that saints are not sinners. There's a change in relationship. And that's the real message. That's the last message of mercy to the world. That's the revelation of God's love. Um, and this is why in their own life and character, they reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The Laodicean church can't do that because they don't even believe that. They don't preach that. And um, all you have to do is listen to them. They'll tell you that. Go to one of their churches and say, yeah, I'm no longer a sinner. God saved me from my sins. They'll run you out on a rail. <laughs> 
And uh, so the conclusion of the matter is, is that there is a consequence to all of this. You know, Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. The, the foolish virgins uh, will not be admitted into the marriage feast. And there is a um, prophecy that is in the uh, book of Amos, chapter 8. Verses 11 and 12, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, where there, when there will be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, but of hearing of the words of the Lord, that people will be running to and fro to try and find the word, and they won't be able to find it. And on the surface, that seems kind of silly because there's Bibles everywhere like dollar stores, the internet. My own phone has like 30 different Bibles on it and one app. So it's like that prophecy sounds ridiculous for, in this time. But the fact is, um, you know, there's a difference between the word of God and the Bible. Uh, you know, <laughs> it says in... Um, in 2 Timothy, it talks about those who are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Well, that is exactly what will happen when probation closes because it's the Holy Spirit that makes the Bible real. And Without the Holy Spirit, it's like you can read the Bible and you're not going to get the point of why it's written. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit's the author. So the Holy Spirit is the one who tells the reader, this is the point I'm trying to make. And, um, you know, when probation closes, that option won't be available because Jesus has already made, it's pointless. Jesus already made up his mind as to who gets what reward. And yes, she says here, without the spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. And, you know, uh, this error that we're, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, um, Peter, one of the last things he says in his second letter he warns about people who misrepresent Paul's writings, that they're setting themselves up for destruction. And, you know, as someone who's been around Christianity for decades, everybody who uses the Bible to defend themselves instead of letting it speak and reveal God to them, they always quote Paul. They never quote anybody else to defend themselves. It's like they always quote Paul. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, God moves in relationship to all this. But anyway, this is the conclusion of the matter for this video. And... Um, it's a very solemn time that we're living in right now because uh, the message is here and the revival of primitive godliness is here. And um, it's going to be interesting to see how many people take hold of it. It's been coming to me that the purpose in pr really publishing this and making these videos 
isn't so much to try and get the Laodicean church to repent or to even convert anybody. It's really to show me the state of Laodicea so I can let go of it and translate from this earth. Because the whole purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain is to prepare a people for translation for when Christ comes to claim the righteous. Uh, and, you know, when you've been involved in churches for three quarters of your entire life, you tend to be pretty deeply entrenched and letting go can be a work. You know, when the reapers come to harvest, they're not just plucking the fruit. You, you are more than the fruit you produce. They're coming to take out the whole plant. Fruit, branches, stems, leaves, roots, the whole thing goes. And uh, some of us are very deeply rooted in some of these things. And um, so some of us need a little more agitation to let go. But... <laughs> When you see it, letting go is actually quite a relief. Uh, so I hope you let go too. It, it'd be wonderful to see others uh, come along. So uh, enjoy your day. And um, I'm going to get back to work uh, with the material for the storm. So see you all later.